you and I can hold in our hand the Word of God. We have the Bible made up of 66 books, and we can hold that in our hand, and we can understand the things that we read if we, when we study it, when we think about it. God will give us that understanding, as he told Timothy. And we just read a passage this morning that we know that it's inspired of God, it's breathed of God. Timothy didn't have the New Testament scriptures, but all scripture is given by inspiration of God. God breathed, it has been given to us, the Old Testament and the New Testament all comprise the scriptures. It makes us wise unto every good work that we can know what is good. We know what to teach, we know what to admonish, we know the source by which we can offer encouragement. We would not know that if God had not revealed his word. We wouldn't. You can look at the sky all day, and I think that what we've just sung, whatever we do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, Colossians 3.17, we wouldn't know to do that. We wouldn't not to know to avoid greed and live a holy life and follow Him. We wouldn't know that. Well, by word and deed, it encompasses everything of our being. I wouldn't know that by looking at nature. But we have it in Scripture. And my question is, what if we did not have God's Word? That we didn't have it at all? I want to investigate that question with you this morning. And the first thing that we'll look at is kind of look at what it's like when you leave God out of it. If we did not have God's Word, we could be John Lennon dreamers. That's what we could be. Imagine, imagine, imagine. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try, just get rid of the Bible. And you wouldn't have to worry about that. It's no hell below us. We wouldn't know about that. Above us is only sky. Yep, that's right. Imagine that. You begin to see that he liked a place with no countries because, see, that's what we kill for. And if you didn't have any countries, you didn't have any religion... We wouldn't have to die for things or kill for things. Imagine all the people living without borders. All one man. You may say that I'm a dreamer. Yes, I would. Wouldn't that be wonderful that to, to not necessarily have, no, have religion, but no killing or dying for? I'm only one, but I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. We just read that. Here's the Bible in Ephesians 4 or 5. It's, there's one faith. We can have unity in that. Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Yeah, you dreamer. I've been to Russia. And I remember leaving the borders of a free society to a communistic society. And you had no bread on the, on the shelves. The type of of government. Well, we're not going to have that. We'll just have the brotherhood of man, and you're going to get resources from the farm to the city people, and we're not going to hunger. You're going to do that, and you're going to get rid of greed. Dream on. Sharing all the world. Is that reality? No, that's what I can imagine. And if I didn't have the Word of God to tell me exactly what the world's like, and how I should live in it, and how I can overcome these problems of greed and hunger? I wouldn't have that. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm the only one. I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and all the world will live as one. When John Lennon wrote the song, he really copied it from his wife. She, she gave him the inspiration, let's put it that way. Oh, no. She wrote a lengthy thing called Grapefruit, and he got the idea about imagining this and imagining that. No religion, no governments, just the brotherhood of man. Imagine this, and we can imagine, and imagine, and imagine, and what a wonderful world that would be like. But it's a dream. And if I didn't have God's word, that's the best you can come up with. Because you still are having to deal with the frustration of the way the world really is. 
And it hasn't changed since John Lennon invited us to all join him. If we didn't have God's Word, we would not have God revealing Himself fully. That's the first point I want to make with you. Yes, the Bible even claims that we can look at the things that are made, look up at the sky. And that's what we see. God said there's no excuse. Because when we see the things that are made, we see His everlasting power and divinity. I think encompassing His wisdom, the manifestation of divinity. That we are indeed without excuse. We can see God revealing Himself in nature. They set forth His handiwork. The heavens declare the glory of God. And what He's brought into existence they express His handiwork. Now, I could have that out there, and I could say, well, it's here. Scripture helps me understand that's how God revealed Himself, but that would be it. If they have Scripture, I might not even know that. I go around even though God says, I'm without excuse. Something's got to bring this thing to, into being. But we wouldn't have the full revelation of God. What do I mean by that? In 1 Samuel 3, 21, if you turn back over there, because I want to bring some things to our, our minds, but just to make this point, in 1 Samuel 3, 21, is that Samuel is having Jehovah reveal himself to him. How? Verse 21 said, Jehovah appeared again in Shiloh, for Jehovah revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh, by the word of Jehovah. Nature reveals the glory of God. Yes. If I didn't have the written word, if I didn't have the book, I would not know Jehovah's revelation of himself fully. I want you to notice how that's important here in these chapters. Eli had two wicked sons, Phineas and Hophni. They would take things that didn't belong to them out of the sacrifice. They were, they were having a, they were committing fornication around the temple. Eli knew it. And he said, why are you doing thus? But he never restrained him. And God speaks to Samuel. And he says in chapter 3 and verse 11, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel that which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. Samuel, I'm going to tell you something's getting ready to happen to the people of Israel and Eli. And when you hear it, it would make your, your ears tingle. Because in the next chapter, Eli's going to die. Phineas and Hophni are going to die. Phineas, his wife, has a child. And she dies in childbirth. Able to give a name, though, Ichabod. The glory of God has departed Israel. All of a sudden, events came together. Would make your ears tingle. How could such bad things happen in one day to one family? You can't believe it. God revealed it to Samuel. By word, communication. You're not going to see that in the sky, and you can't retrieve it. You can't retrieve this historical account. But look what we learn. When he spoke to him in verse 23, or chapter 3, verse 13, For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew, because his sons did bring a curse upon themselves and restrained them not. He knew what his sons were doing, he said, why are you doing this? But he didn't restrain them. And bring in iniquity. Therefore I've sworn in the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated with sacrifice nor offering forever. How would you ever know that looking at nature? That there comes a time in your life where no sacrifice would ever save you. How would I know that? When it comes time to judgment. Oh, we, some of us don't even know that. There comes a time when God is not going to say, don't you pray for them? No sacrifice is going to change. Judgment is coming. How would I know that? He's talking to Samuel. 
He's revealing his mind to Samuel about this. And indeed, these things are going to happen. So chapter 4, the Ark of the Covenant, there's the presence of God, it's stolen. Phineas and Hophni die. Eli's an old man. He's a little heavy. And he falls backward and breaks his neck. And the word comes to Phineas, his wife. She hears about the death of her husband. She hears about the death of Eli, so she respected. And she gives childbirth prematurely. She is going to die. All of those things happen because men made wrong choices. Hophni and Phineas made a choice to take the sacrifice they didn't really belong to them, to practice fornication, commit adultery. Eli had a choice. Am I going to just talk and say, y'all not do that or I'm going to restrain them? You got the Ark of the Covenant being looked over by Hophni and Phineas, two ungodly men. And it's going to be taken from them. Choices. And why did you marry Phineas anyway? Character matters in marriage. And all those choices come to one horrible event one day. If I got news like that, I say, boy, aren't that an unlucky, that's an unlucky family. Can you imagine? Yeah, your ears are tingling. That's what God said to, to God. He revealed himself to God, to, Eli, to, to Samuel. And we wouldn't have that if there was no word. God revealed himself, power and divinity of nature. God revealed himself in words that communicate mind and thought that help us understand God in his holiness. And we indeed would be without that. Secondly, we would not know why Jesus is the focal point of history. I believe that. The Bible teaches us that. It's a story of salvation in Christ. But even in our history of mankind, why can't we have A.D.? Why, how come we have B.C.? Before Christ and after death? No, that's not it. Before Christ is it. Why do we have events of history being recorded before Christ? A.D. from the Latin meaning in the year of the Lord. He probably was born in 4 B.C. <laughs> you can never do that. But in the year of our Lord is how we start looking at things after Jesus comes in the flesh. Oh, that's just religious stuff, and religion had a power over the world at one time. Yes, that's, I think there's a lot to that. But you know what man is doing? we got B.C., but it's before the common era, B.C.E., they're trying to take God out of his influence in our, our world and trying to change history. People try to rewrite history all the time. But when we see things unfold in history, even from a secular point of view at one time, we had no problem saying B.C., A.D. But it referenced the fact of Christ coming into this world. If I didn't have... The book of God, I would look at a bunch of things that we have in books and sometimes we don't understand this. We need to understand it. But if I didn't have that, I wouldn't know that in the beginning when man sinned and God addresses the devil, you're going to bruise the offspring of woman, the seed of woman. You're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. That was a prophecy. That was something that was going to come true. And all of a sudden, as I see the scriptures unfold, in Hebrews 2 and verse 14, the reason Jesus took on flesh and blood is so he could die. And that he did that so he could destroy the fear of man that Satan had on them because of death. He would take that way. He would bring a head blow and not only destroy the works of the devil, but take the sting of death by taking away that which is causes sting, sin. And that would be accomplished in Jesus. There's a lot of history from the beginning of the world and to the time of Jesus Christ. But it's coming together as a story. Genesis 12, 12 chapter verse 3, there was a promise that in you, Abram, who would become Abraham, 
that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And we come to the New Testament in Galatians 3 and verse 8, that blessing was fulfilled according to Scripture. We don't have it, no, if we don't have it. But if we, since we do, we would not know that from God's plan that the Gentiles would be justified by faith in Christ Jesus. That's what that all nations would be blessed. Not only Jew, Jesus came as a Jew, born as a Jew, in order to redeem the Jews, but also to justify Gentiles from their sins. I wouldn't know that. I'm not going to look at that in nature and, and come up with how history has unfolded. Old Testament prophecy, things that were spoken about in Genesis 3.15, but Isaiah 53 of this suffering servant, of Psalm 22, which would be expressions of what Jesus would say on the cross, of helping the Jews understand the Messiah is going to come. Jesus would open the eyes of two travelers. He would also open the eyes of the apostles in Luke 24, 44 through 47 by saying the things that Moses and the prophets and the Psalms said about me, Jesus says. They spoke of Jesus, and Jesus indeed fulfilled them. And what would happen beginning in Jerusalem that in his name, remission of sins would be preached beginning from Jerusalem, came true. History unfolds before our eyes. But we wouldn't know the story. We wouldn't know the purpose of God in doing that. Thirdly, if we did not have God's word, we wouldn't have the new birth because they go together. In fact, there is no place in the New Testament where people are born again by the Spirit. They're not born again without the Word of God. So take it out of the way. You're not going to have what Jesus says. You must be born again in John 3 and verse 3, born from above. And in verse 5, born of the water and the Spirit. You're not going to be able to see the kingdom. You're not going to be able to enter the kingdom if you're not born again. Well, we wouldn't have it if we didn't have God's Word because that's what it took. The Spirit revealed Word. Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. When he speaks about those who have purified their souls and their obedience to the truth, they love one another from the heart fervently, having been begotten again. This is what happened. How did that happen? Not of corruptible seed. It's not a fleshly process of birth. Not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which liveth and abideth. Verse 25, it's the word of good tidings which was preached unto you. Without the preaching of the word, there's no new birth. You don't have some miraculous work of the Holy Spirit apart from the word in order to have the new birth. By his own will in James 1.18, this was God's plan. By his own will, he has begotten people by the word of truth. That we should be a first fruits of his creatures. Born again, being in the likeness of God, born again, now redeemed from our sins, we're to live as a new creature. And that was God's plan in James 1 and verse 18. And that word was indeed preached. Paul, Acts 26, 18, was told to open their eyes. They may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto Christ and salvation unto God and the redemption that we have in Christ, obtaining the remission of sins and an inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith. He takes us from being dead in sin, a sinner, to heaven. Go preach. You open your eyes. How do you do that? Paul preached. There's not a joyous heart of being a Christian without first hearing the Word of God in the book of Acts. Not one. Because that is necessary, the revealed mind of God. It's not saying, let's go out and look at the sunset and get energized for God. Let's go out and look at a sunrise. Hey, new life, new expectation, and we be born again. We can't travel to different 
planets and say, Marvel, God's big. It's going to happen. It's going to happen because of the revelation of God's word. And without it, we will not have the new birth. Fourthly, we would not have the joy in faith. In fact, we wouldn't have faith, saving faith. We wouldn't need it. We just imagine things. No religion. But faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God or the word of Christ, depending on what, re what translation you have. That's where faith comes. And when we take that in and receive that and obey its conditions, we're born again by the teachings of the Spirit and the water, and baptism. And then we continue to walk by the Spirit as a new creature. But it comes that way. I see faith. Oh, but if we could just have joy. If we could have joy in life, you're going to have it John Lennon's way? You're going to be exasperated. As history, history, history unfolds and the nature of man in each generation occurs, you're going to be a frustrated man, a frustrated woman. But God doesn't sugarcoat that. He said, this is what you are. This is what you can be in Christ. And you know what? You can be a joyous Christian. There's joy in faith. Listen to Paul. Paul says, it'd be far much better for me to die and go to heaven and be or be with the presence of the Lord as one day he'll be in heaven. But he says, I have this confidence. I know that I shall abide, yea, abide with you all of, for, for your what? For your progress and joy in the faith. Paul put joy connected with not only faith, but in this passage, the faith. Do you ever look at your daily Bible reading? I got to do this. I got to get this done. And if I don't, I, I'm, I'm going to go meet my schedule. And you have no joy? Is that the way you read your Bible? You're reading the mind of God. Some things you wouldn't know if it hadn't been for the Word. You ought to be excited about it. But joy? Or do I have to get it done? Got a work to do. Got to, all right, that did my five chapters. Did my three chapters. And we get on our schedules. And we're getting ready to start a new year. Is there joy in your faith this hour? Or is that not fair? Because we're just worn out enjoying our families. Doing this and doing that. We're worn out. That's life. But what we do, we come this morning and refresh our minds. Lord, I'm glad we got this. And I'm glad you told about the joy in faith. And Paul says to the Corinthians, I'm not lording it over your faith. Not that we as apostles have lordship over your faith, but are helpers of your joy. Why? I'm just supposed to rejoice. No, see, God's Word tells us things. The reason that you can have joy in your faith is because in faith ye stand fast. Can you see what a blessing that is? When the world's pulling, pulling this way and you're going that way, oh, is this going to be my thoughts? Is this the way I'm going to live my life? What are my goals? And all of a sudden it, you, you, you get bombarded with the things of this world and we fight the battles. Does it take away your joy? No, it shouldn't. Because what gives me the joy, even through my tears and my suffering, is because I'm standing fast. I got something to stand on. God says it's not going to be a pie in the sky and everything's wonderful in brotherhood of man. There's going to be battles, there's going to be suffering. But I'm not moved. I'm steadfast in my faith. You take away the word of God, you're not going to have faith that is steadfast. You'll be disappointed. And what the believer who takes in the word of God says, I am steadfast in my faith. There's my joy. 
even when I'm suffering. There's my joy even when I'm sick. There's with my joy even when I'm dying. You didn't take away my joy. Yeah, I did. If we didn't have the Word of God. In John 17, 13, Jesus offers up this prayer for His apostles and for those that we see in verse 20 that would believe on me through their word. How are we ever going to believe on Jesus? I mean, this generation when history is trying to erase anything connected with Jesus? John Lennon laughed when he wrote this song because at that time people were saying he's more popular, or the Beatles were more popular than Jesus. And he has the answers. God has the answers, not man. And Jesus says, they're going to believe on me through the word. But listen to what comes through, what promises come through the spoken word. The, the scriptures. I've come to thee, and these things I speak in the world. I, now I come, I'm going to you, Father, but these things I speak in the world. Why? Because I want to make their life miserable. I'm righteous, they're not. They've got to be holy, they're not. Battles, persecution, that's going to make their life miserable. This is for my glory. No. I speak in the world that they may have my joy made full in themselves. Without revealing in words, the mind of God, we wouldn't have that. That our faith is to have joy with it. And that has come through the promises that Jesus has spoken in the world. You took it out of the world, we would not know that. We would not know the purpose from God about why history unfolded the way it did. Why do we have the Jewish nations? Why do we have all these nations that rose and fall, rose and fell? What's all these prophecies about? Salvation in Christ. That's what it's about. You and I know that because not nature, not the wisdom of men, but it's because of the written word. So this morning, the point is that God has revealed himself, but he's done so in a book. In the book of books, he's done so. And what is so wonderful about the book is that it reveals to us who we are. We're not just animals. Not from, you know, we live on earth with the animals. We have a spirit of life just like animals do. Animals die, we die. But we're different from all creation because God created us in his own image. Whether we're a woman or a man, male and female, created he them. I know I am a spiritual creature. I can look at things and I could experience things and I could never be satisfied if I just fulfill the lust of my flesh, I want more and more, and it gets worse and worse and degrading, degrading. I give my life to that. And I can just imagine what it'd be like if everybody loved one another. No religion, nothing demanded of us. No greed, no hunger. But I'm a dreamer. No, I'm a reader. And I'm re reading on a book that says, here is what I am. And when I am fulfilling the lust of my flesh, I'm sometimes feeling empty. I'm spiritually empty. It's not satisfying me. And I know why, because I am a spiritual creature, and I know why I'm here. You do too, if you read your Bible. God created man to glorify him. He brought man into existence to glorify God. And you thought you were just to glorify yourself. 
Glorify God. That's why Romans 3.23, when we sin, we fall short of the glory of God. It's a story that comes together, a revelation of God's mind. I know God. I know what's on His mind. The glorious God of heaven wants us to glorify Him. That's why He created us. I got a purpose in life. And I go to the book of God to find out how to do that. And thirdly, I know where we're going. And what is so wonderful about God's wisdom in a book? He gave us a whole book in this book called Ecclesiastes. And you can dream on with Solomon. As he was able to experience so many things in life that you think you'd like to experience. I want to be rich. I want to be wise. I want to enjoy all the things that I have. The good music. The good scenery. The good gardens. The beautiful gardens. I want to take it all in. Because see, that's uh, why I'm here. And he experienced it all. But he says life is fleeting so fast. It leaves you empty. Is there anything more that I'm missing? And we come to that last chapter. All has been said. Here's the duty of man. Fear God and keep his commandments. That's what you're all about. That's how the spiritual creatures we are, where our purpose is going to be fulfilled. I want you to notice in that very last verse that God's going to bring every work into judgment. And every hidden thing will come into judgment. That's what he's going to do. So all of my deeds, my hidden thoughts, God has revealed I'm bringing you into judgment. That's why you need to reverence me. And it's in a context of people pursuing what they think would be great in life. Young people, get a hold of that book. And set yourself on my purpose is to glorify him. Therefore, I will reverence him and I will keep his commandments. And I know where I'm going. All we, Jesus talks about heaven and hell. But I'm going to the judgment. All the hidden things, everything I've done is going to be brought out. And you know who I'm facing? In 2 Corinthians 5.10, we'll come before the judgment seat of Christ. The focal point of history. And we all will give answer of what we've done in the body, whether it be good or evil. Ecclesiastes 12.14 talks about whether it be good or bad. Whether it be good or evil, we'll give an answer of what we've done. I tell you, you're on a head start, young people. When you grasp that, and you say, here's how I'm going to live my life to the glory of God. I know where I'm going. And while I'm going there, I am so joyful that I have Christ. I can be steadfast in my faith in a world that's ever-changing. And you have the wisdom that you can never get from nature. And you can say, I see God there in the sense of what he's created. It's his handiwork. But I've got his full revelation here. And I'm so happy that I've got it. And I surely want to start reading it. And I hope he'll encourage you to do so. This, eve, this morning we offer you the invitation. There's a fountain free. Oh, free. It cost Jesus his life. It cost him suffering, being rejected of men. It caused him to leave his home where he was glorified as God and to a world that he was accused of being blasphemous because he claimed to be of God. But he died for us all. And the wonderful good news of the gospel is that we can be saved this very day. There is no new birth without the Bible, without the word of God, without the gospel. And you've heard that message unfolded in the platform of history. Why not get a hold of why we have history the way we do and come to grips with your relationship with Christ? He's ready to save you. And he wants to add you to the body of the saved, 
of the saved people. He wants you to go to heaven. He wants you to rejoice and enjoy your life as a Christian because you can remain steadfast regardless of the difficulty. We offer that to you in Christ. Come as we stand and as we sing.